Ja, um, I'm from the Institute for Theoretical Physics, and indeed there is a connection between biology and physics, uh, as you will see today. And um, when there is uh, the question of attraction in biology, of course, um, we are not actually interested in, for example, what attracts these two ladybugs to each other, but we are interested in the interaction between surfaces. Yeah? And the question is, what are the burning questions here? And the questions are, how do surfaces attract each other across an intermediate medium? So you have one medium and another one and something in between. And uh, what is the attraction? What, is the for what are the forces that act between the two? Maybe they are not attracted. This is one interesting case. Uh, what is the physics behind it? Can it be tuned? Can we compute the forces that act between the surfaces? What are the relevant properties of the molecules in the interlayer, which is blue here? This is what we are studying. And what shall we measure to better understand all of this? And of course, are there applications? Okay, so let's see. The first example is the lizard, because the talk was from lizard to leaves. So what has a lizard to do with that? This is a special lizard, which is called sandfish, because it's able to swim practically in sand. It has special sugar molecules called glycans on, on its skin, on the scales. This is investigated in the group of Professor Werner Baumgartner and the Institute of Biomedical Mechatronics here at the JKU. And he approached us to discuss uh, the physical underpinning of, of this effect. And what these sugar molecules on the skin do, they reduce the attraction between the skin or the scales yeah, on the, in the sand and allow the fish to move fast in the sand. So not the fish, the sandfish is the lizard actually. And the question is why sugars? Yeah, and are there guidelines for surface coatings? Can we learn something about what makes this surface so gliding or, or smooth? On the other hand, we have leaves. So again, we are not interested in the ladybugs, but in the leaves because of the photosynthesis going on there. So photosynthesis means uh, solar energy conversion, practically. And what, where are the surfaces here? Um, if we look into a leaf, we see, of course, some tissue. Then we see cells, and in the cells we see green sacs that are, or green bags that are called chloroplasts. And these chloroplasts contain all the chlorophyll, which makes the leaves green. And this is where the photosynthesis takes place. And inside of plant cells and chloroplasts, we have membrane stacks. Yeah, so we see here there are, if you look even closer, we see a lot of proteins, some uh, biological macromolecules in, inside the membrane. And one of the questions here is um, what, what holds these um, membranes together? How are these stacks formed? Yeah, so these are inter so interaction between membranes and stacks. Um, this was investigated or is investigated by Helmut Kirchhoff in the Washington State University of Pullman, USA, and he approached us as well to get a theoretical underpinning of his experiments. So the stacking apparently redistributes the protein in the membranes. It also changes the flight conditions, and this is interesting because the plant has to react somehow, whether there is high sunlight or low sunlight. Um, we can use a sun blocker to avoid uh, sunburn, but the plant has to do other things. And among them is a redistribution of these membranes. And we would like to understand how is this regulated and how is it influencing the solar energy conversion. So everything that is green here absorbs light energy and distributes it somewhere where it is then transformed into chemical energy to produce all the materials the plant is con uh, consists of. And of course, it is a burning question to understand how these membranes work in this arrangement. Okay, but let's go back to the lizard first. What is actually determining the force? So one, one important point here is that we have three different materials here, scale, sugar, sand. And the forces between the scale and the sand are influenced by fluctuating electromagnetic fields in the sugar layer. We heard already in the first talk about the electromagnetic radiation. So don't worry, I will explain to you what this formula means, because this is how we compute the force. So what we have to do is we need this epsilon as a function of omega. So epsilon is, so to say, a function that describes how a material reacts to electromagnetic radiation or electric fields, yeah? so electric response function. And this depends on the frequency of the electromagnetic field. And what we have to determine is this function, is a func so this epsilon is a function of omega for all these materials, and then we have to sum it up for certain frequencies. And how can we get this information? We need to measure the absorption of the material. Um, so 
practically the energy that materials absorb as a function of the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation. The problem is here that we need the information for the whole frequency range from zero to the UV region. So this is ultraviolet, infrared. Visible light is somewhere here, which is not so important here. And this was, um, I wrote tedious here because it is a bit difficult to get all this information together to be able to go on. But we were lucky in so far as we could get them for these three materials enough information. So BSA is actually bovine serum albumin, it's a protein in the blood of cows. Humans also have it. We use this as a kind of model for the skin of the, of the um, lizard. The quartz is clear, it is sand, it's practically cesium dioxide, and glucose is, of course, a, a typical sugar. So we were able to put together all this information, but it's not so as easy as it sounds, because you, have, you cannot get from one experiment in the, also in the literature, you do not get everything of, of the whole frequency range, only parts, and then you have to put everything consistently together, and this is somewhat tedious. This is one of the challenges for the future to get all the information for all materials in this way. So, and then we do some mathematics. So, don't ask for details. This is a so called Kramers Kronig transformation, which relates this information to the functions that we need here to compute the force. It's a lot of math, and what the result is, is another function. But this is now the one that goes here into this equation. And now the relevant point is the following the relevant point is that here, the green curve is between the red and the blue, because what does this mean? What we have to do is we have to look at all these, so at these certain so-called Matsubara frequencies. So at certain frequencies, we have to look and compute these differences here. So as the, as the black points. And in this region, red minus green is positive and blue minus green <coughs> is negative. So minus times plus gives minus. So from this region comes a negative contribution to the sum. And this is a relevant point here, because usually one expects that the interaction is attractive. And here we have now, we could now see that in a certain frequency range, we get information uh, or we get uh, a negative contribution that may contribute or uh, not contribute, that may compensate the positive contributions that may come from, oh, sorry, from zero, oops, it comes from zero frequency and from this ultraviolet range. So this was what we looked for. This is practically the proof of principle that, in, that it can happen that if you have a sugar between a protein and the sand, then there is a, might be a reduction of the attractive forces. And this is what we basically think is the effect in the case of the sandfish. We also learned from this that what is relevant here, if you look at the frequency range, that this is actually related to molecular vibrations, which was also not so clear before. So, for example, for quartz, this is some vibrations of silicon and oxygen atoms against each other. For the protein, it is actually, the protein is a biopolymer, which has a backbone, and in this backbone, there are typical structures that have typical vibrations. And then, of course, the sugar has ring structures that vibrate, but also small electric dipoles, the so-called hydroxyl groups, that also can move. And these things are important now to determine how these curves look like and what finally the force between the surfaces is. This also may, uh, leaves tuning options because um, if you can somehow modify the motions of these groups, this may also modify the function and so you might be able to tune the interaction and also adapt it to different materials. So this is what we are, hyper, which is our hypothesis that um, here there are tuning options. Okay, let me say a bit about the leaf. In the case of the leaf, we have two membranes with something that is essentially water in between. But here we have two times the same material. So if we now do the same thing here, there's no chance to get anything negative. This is always an attraction. But in this particular case, there is another problem. There are charges on the surfaces of the membranes and they give rise to a repulsion. And the question that was discussed for decades in the literature is whether these forces are able to compensate for the repulsion. Recently, we did some calculations on that based on earlier estimates of these functions and found the following. If you look into these curves, when they cross the zero line, then this means the force is zero, so there is 
um, force balance. Sorry. And this determines then the distance between the membranes. So when we choose the right parameters in our computations, then we see that we are in a realistic range because this shaded area is experimental. So we are talking here about three to four nanometer spacing between the membranes. <coughs> and um, so we, we got it. So this means that in principle, the theory works well. If we increase the charge on the surfaces, then the distance becomes somewhat larger. So this means that yeah, first of all, the theory works. On the other hand, we have also tuning options here. The charges on the inter membrane interfaces may be able to affect whether the stacks are formed or not. And this is something that the plant probably also uses, but this is something which still has to be further investigated. Okay, let me conclude. On the lizard side, we have shown that this, which is called Lifshitz theory, by the way, um, provides a basic explanation for the sandfish effect according to our results. Molecular vibrations are important, which is then in particular hydroxyl groups and their motions might provide tuning options for these forces. And this also, by the way, gives us now a hint that a special type of simulation, which is called molecular dynamic simulations, makes sense because this is about motions of molecules. Uh, we did not know before that this is really relevant here. The implementation, however, requires experiment data of the involved materials. If you want to make it precise, you need to measure particularly these functions for this, for example, for the scales of the, of the lizard. This is somewhat challenging because you cannot measure these things with one machine. You need the whole frequency range. So I hope that in the future we will get enough experimentalists uh, to cooperate with us to, for, to get all the data consistently together. Of course, this has possible applications. Yeah? You can think of designing surface coatings to reduce, for example, the sticking of sand to a surface. Um, I recently learned that this might be interesting for solar cells. Yeah? So put some sugar on the solar cell and then it possibly the sand is not covering it anymore. So this would be an idea for an application. On the leaf side, Lifshitz theory also works well if you combine it with some electrostatic computations. By the way, this also lends support to this side because we know from this particular that the theory really works. Um, also, molecular vibrations play a role, but this is a more complicated issue here. Here, the charges on the membranes are of interest and, of course, also the composition and every, everything. And this has possible a role in regulating the solar energy conversion in plants, and this is why it is fundamentally of interest. Maybe not so much in applications at, at the moment, but more in the fundamental research of plants, but yeah, it's of interest. I have to thank Ekaterina Sobakinskaya, for example, she's, she's also in the audience here today, and Svetoslav Narkov, who did the main tedious work on the Sandfish side. Yeah, I also have to thank Thomas Renger, who is a co-PI in these projects, and Werner Baumgarten and Helmut Kirchhoff, who actually inspired uh, us to look into this theory and also finally we found the connection between the two topics. And I have to thank the LIT and the FWF for financial support. This was really helpful for us, in particular the LIT to get these initial studies done to see whether it is meaningful at all to study this. And thank you for your attention.